So uh, vibration causes movement and in general an audible sound. Uh, now audible um, just means within the range of human hearing. So if that frequency, if the rate of oscillation is low, then you probably can't hear it. If it's below 20 hertz, most people can't hear it. If it's above 20,000 hertz or 18,000 hertz, people generally can't hear it. But this uh, vibratory motion pushes air. That air can reach your ear and it, uh, it indicates a sound. And you can actually use that sound to your advantage. Um, see how long it takes to do this. And I've done it actually several times uh, using that audible sound can tell you whether things are going the way that they're supposed to go. So this is just a, an app on, on my tablet right here that is a spectrum analyzer. All it does is pick up the sound from the microphone and display the frequency distribution there. So if I So uh, I've used this several times where people wonder if they're supposedly putting in one distinct frequency and they're going, okay, I'm putting in one frequency, but things aren't doing the way what they're supposed to. I can walk up with this and just let it listen and I can tell, oh, wait a minute. No, there's multiple frequencies present at the same time, which is uh, definition wise actually distortion. And uh, I was using uh, this, this business of using the audible sound for uh, machinery maintenance detection. Uh, just recently, um, I have a spa at my house and I noticed one of the pumps started squealing and making ugly noises. So I knew which pump it was and which, uh, which one needed to be replaced. Now we'll go through a chapter on Wednesday on fatigue. So prolonged vibration, even at low amplitudes can cause fatigue failures. When we go through fatigue, We'll talk about the SN curve, and the SN curve, we'll go through this, but SN just means stress versus number of cycles to failure. And it has an indicative shape, kind of looks like that. And if you look at this little flat spot out here, you'll see that that, and I'm gonna just endurance limit there. So that's the endurance limit. So any stress below that, doesn't do any damage. It'll never fail, ever, ever, ever. So stress, that's the stress for in, the stress boundary for infinite life. It's hard to find those SN curves on every material. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's really hard. When you just search like Nitronic 60, I was trying to find SN curves for Nitronic 60 the other day. I couldn't find it. But you know, if you go on MatWeb, they, they have a lot of material properties and fatigue isn't one of them. Um, they're, they're really hard to find. Um, I haven't had to look it up in a long time. The last time I looked up fatigue properties, I was looking it up in, uh, maybe it's out of print, it's something called the Fatigue Atlas. And I don't know whether they maintain it, but it used to be you know, an encyclopedia of SN curves. I, that I haven't checked. The last time I looked at it was in paper form. And no handbook five is pretty good, but they don't have all the materials. Can't keep up. They're always coming up with new materials. Okay. And that's looking for the SN curve. You might be able to find endurance limit, maybe. Uh, but what I was getting at is uh, that if you're making something out of steel, for instance, it may have that really nice endurance limit so that you can design your structure to be low the endurance limit and it'll last forever. But what if you're, test, if, if you're designing with aluminum Aluminum does not have a well-defined endurance limit. It just keeps going, drops off, drops off. So eventually it will finally crack, even at low levels. And that's one of the problems uh, and one of the concerns with legacy fixtures. Um, you have an aluminum or magnesium fixture that's been being used for testing for 15 or 20 years. It's racked up a lot of cycles. And aluminum doesn't have a well-defined endurance limit. So over time, they can start to crack. Uh, you can use vibration for positive purposes as well. Obviously, musical instruments, massage equipment, bells, buzzers, and other types of enunciators. Um, I refer to MEMS mirrors here. Uh, I'll talk about MEMS to, wow, actually, I think it's on Thursday. Uh, MEMS stands for Microelectrical Mechanical System. Uh, I mentioned MEMS mirrors. If this is a projector here, it has a DLP chip in it. 
There's a whole bunch of mirrors in there that are all dithering back and forth like this, directing the white light to give us the colors and the, uh, and the pixels that we want here. They're using vibration for positive purposes. Um, ultrasonic parts feeders, um, ultrasonic cleaners, all of those kinds of things use vibration for a positive purpose. Uh, here's an example of uh, something that is being trying to be implemented right now. Uh, it's being called an energy harvester. There was a research group at the university that was trying to do this. So these, um, I'll pass this around and you can look at it. So this is a black plastic box with wires coming off. There's a little printed circuit board in there. There isn't a whole lot of things going on in the printed circuit board. Most of it is just capacitors. Those two things right there, that and that. Those are two thin cantilever beams and I have one of them right here and I'll pass it around and you can look at it. So those are sitting there and they do this and vibrate like a reed. If you look here and when I pass it around, you'll see that it has this really cool squiggly pattern on it. And the squiggly pattern is a piezoelectric material that is woven in this funny S pattern. So what this does is when you vibrate it like this, a piezoelectric material generates a charge proportional to stress, which if you stick it into a capacitor will actually build up a voltage slash a charge. So you can store up <coughs> this vibrational energy. So that's why they call this a vibration harvester. Um, I'll pass it uh, is if you take this box and put it in a vibration rich environment, that will generate a charge and a voltage and you can store it up. So now if you were to take this and put it in a car engine compartment or something like that, you could use these parasitic vibrations from driving and engine unbalance and all of that and build up energy that you can use to charge your phone or keep the battery charged or what have you. That's the goal of this thing. It's a neat idea. Uh, the dictionary definition, so uh, Webster just says that vibration is uh, periodic motion of particles in an elastic body or medium in alternately opposite directions from equilibrium. So I just showed you an example of that in that vibrating read. Um, so this. So this piece, the tip right here, is vibrating in alternately opposite direction from equilibrium like that. So it's this kind of thing, and it's reasonably easy to imagine. Uh, now, definition B, the action of vibrating. Um, I was told in elementary school, you can't define a word with itself. So calling, defining vibration as the act of vibrating doesn't seem quite fair. Uh, so let's stick with uh, definition A. Now, this mechanical motion, illustrated a couple of times already, uh, it's defined by a displacement time history. If it's continuous, we'll call it vibration. If it's a single event, we'll call it a transient or a shock. Now, you can combine shock and vibration. That tends to be a reasonably aggressive environment because a shock event can cause a crack to start. And once a crack is started, it advances much, much more quickly. Uh, this is a case study from uh, uh, Russia. So on the Yenisei River in Russia, there is a dam uh, with has a hydroelectric power plant on it. So up here would be the lake, and over here is the river. So the lake water comes down this way, runs through the turbine, and then goes back out into the river, and this is all of the power generation uh, equipment. As the result of unbalance, so the uh, turbine number two, it's held in by some pins, so it holds the thing into place and allows it to spin. Well, a rotational unbalance condition in the rotor caused the pins to fatigue. Now, the problem with that is you have a rotational unbalance, which is a cyclic load that is applied to these pins. Now, the pins start to fatigue and crack. When the pins crack, their stiffness changes, which causes even more rotational unbalance, and it feeds on itself and just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So eventually, those, uh, those pins fatigue and sheared off. And when the pins sheared off, there was nothing to hold this 1,500-ton rotor in place. So this thing gets launched out of the bottom of the control room. Now, you've got this thing. It gets launched 50 feet into the air. comes back down sideways, kind of like this. There's nothing to plug this hole. Now the entire lake is pumped into this. and 
you have this huge geyser um, emptying 67,000 gallons per second into the turbine hall where all the other turbines want to live. Well, all of the other turbines are just happily going along making electricity, but they're being flooded at the same time. So electricity and water don't go well together. So you end up with electrical explosions, which dump a lot of the oil that is used in the generating equipment into the river. So this comes falling down like that. Um, it took employees about an hour to get the intake gates closed at the top of the dam and bypass the spillways around the dam and stop this. Um, in the following days where they went in and dug everything out, um, they, they rescued 14 people, but actually 75 people died. Uh, so that's the before exhibit, and um, I, I, I apologize for this picture. I probably had a mirror. This one is a mirror image. So the, the lake is up here, and the river is out this way. But that's what it looked like afterwards. So you can see this gargantuan hole here where the turbine used to be. And for a sense of scale, these are people down here. There's another one right by. And there is it down on the bottom. So this took place in uh, 2009. Uh, a number of people have asked, uh, well, didn't they know that this was, that this was going on? Uh, this facility was actually made in the 70s, and now there, there is a lot of monitoring equipment going on that would tell you that the imbalance is going bad or these pins are fatiguing. There would be uh, you know, fail-safe equipment, but when it was built in the 70s, there wasn't any of this vibration monitoring equipment there. And there's that section of the, uh, of the controls. Uh, the control center uh, completely blown out, as well as the water bypassing the dam the way that it's supposed to. Vibration has parameters of amplitude, frequency, and phase or delay. We'll go through that. Um, vibration is caused by a lot of different things. It can be natural events, or they can be forced vibrations from um, engineering structures or engineering equipment. But as far as a designer goes, a designer needs to estimate or determine the forces that a structure might see. And then, once they know those, design your structure to withstand those, uh, those forces. Now, uh, if let's say that you are the designer, uh, how do you come up with those forces that a structure is going to see? Well, if you have a specification, that's pretty easy. The spec tells you what you're supposed to design to. It gives you the design envelope. But if you don't have a specification, you have to figure these things out yourself. So you have to look around and see what your device or structure will see during transport, storage, and use. Now I emphasize transport, storage, and use because it depends on what your discipline is and what your device does. Uh, let's just look at uh, that's anything that's going to be uh, put into space. The vast majority of components that gets launched up into space, this is the worst. Once you get it up into space, it's cool. But the launch is what you design for. That's the worst case environment is launch or transport. But for the vast majority of what a lot of people do, use. What your customer does to your thing is what you design for. You want it to design it to last a long time. But it's also possible that storage could be uh, potentially the worst case. Um, I've got an example of that kind of thing here. Um, I'll pass this around as well. This is a uh, unidirectional pull-truded carbon fiber rod. Yeah, so it's made out of carbon, uh, carbon fibers with epoxy matrix. It is unidirectional. It just means the fibers run down the length. There's none the other way. So they're all that direction. Uh, now imagine that you wanted to make a spring, something to store energy. So you take a spring, a coil spring, and squash it and it stores energy. Well, if that spring is made out of steel, it's heavy, and we don't like to launch heavy things. So what if we make a spring out of carbon fiber rod? So we're going to take this carbon fiber, make a long piece of it like wire, and then bend it up like this and make a helix out of it. And now we've got a light, stiff spring. And that's what uh, ATK space. ATK Space Systems uh, in Goleta, California, uh, that was their idea behind 
trying to store up energy so that when they launch it up into space, they have a lot of energy that they can release and deploy structures with, like solar panels and things like that. Well, the reason I'm talking about them with regard to storage is that they take this carbon fiber rod, coil it all up into a spring, compress that spring, store a lot of energy, and then send that structure down to Florida, where it sits down there for potentially years before it's launched. So now you have this carbon fiber rod that has a large amount of strain on it, sitting in high temperatures, high humidity for years on end. And the question is, okay, uh, it behaved a certain way when we wound it up, but after it's been being cooked down in Florida, is it still the same stuff? So it turns out for them, creep or time dependent deformation under temperature is the big problem. So storage was their big hassle, not necessarily launch or actual use. For them, use isn't a big deal. Use for ATK, uh, use normally is about 30 minutes. That's, that's their entire useful life. They say go, it goes, and it's done. It's used. Uh, we won't talk about it uh, in here. We do in the fundamentals class, uh, something called environmental stress screening. Uh, that's a process uh, that is different than vibration testing. It's used to stress components and systems with the goal of locating components or subassemblies with manufacturing defects. That's the thing about stress screenings. You're looking for manufacturing defects or flaws. Now, a lot of times I, I have a tendency to say environmental stress screening, the goal is to try to break something on purpose. Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, what you want to do is to stimulate latent failures until they become big enough that you can detect them. Uh, now, this stimulating of latent failures a lot of times does not simulate the environment. A lot of environmental stress screening levels are substantially higher than vibration test levels. Uh, we'll talk about shakers on Thursday. Uh, shakers are just the machine that delivers this vibratory motion that we want. Um, like I said, I'll talk, we'll talk about it later. Uh, we'll talk about shock machines as well. Uh, the thing about a shock machine, it's pretty much a way to store energy and release it in a controlled way. And we'll talk about rotational unbalance for quite a while, just because rotational unbalance is a good way to illustrate vibration in a very visual and easy to understand way. So if we have an auto engine, and this auto engine is rotating around and it has lots of imbalances, that's cylinders bouncing back and forth, has crankshafts that aren't, aren't perfectly balanced. So every rotation of that thing, it's generating vibratory unbalanced motion. And that motion, we would like to isolate from the rest of the vehicle. We don't want to feel the engine vibration in the, uh, in the passenger compartment. So we use flexible engine mounts, and we'll go through at length how to design vibration isolators, which is what those are. Um, the, those mechanical motions can be coupled through the structure itself. The chassis of a car is very stiff, so that those rotational imbalances can be coupled uh, through the structure. Now, there's other types of things going on in an auto engine. Uh, there's uh, acoustically coupled noise, which a lot of times is called noise. Um, and I already mentioned what causes that vibration. Um, oh, in here, we'll be talking about uh, the rate of vibration in cycles per second or hertz. But uh, from time to time, we'll talk about it in revolutions per minute. So if you have <laughs> some sort of vibration that occurs at a certain rate that is expressed in revolutions per minute, if you take RPM, divide it by 60, you'll get frequency in hertz. So it's just a uh, 60 seconds per minute kind of conversion factor. So uh, therefore, if you have a uh, rotor that spins at 1800 RPM, it generates 30 hertz. That's one of the other reasons that 3600 RPM is such a common AC motor speed is because 60 hertz is what comes out of the wall. Um, 60 hertz times 60 gives you 3600 RPM. Now, um, before we get into the next chapter where I'll derive or, uh, or illustrate these equations, um, I'm gonna do this. 
and I emphasize proportional, it's not exact, but the frequency of oscillation is inversely proportional to the oscillatory displacement squared. So as the frequency goes up, the displacement goes down very quickly. And as the frequency goes down, the displacement goes up very quickly. Those of you that work in the lab see that. High frequency tests, the displacements are incredibly small. You can't see them. Uh, so if I, if I make another kind of sweeping assumption here, and let's say that displacement is proportional to stress, that seems reasonable. Now we have the, at low frequencies, the stresses are high. And that's generally what most designers will look at. They will look at the lowest natural frequency of a structure and concentrate on that one, because in general, the lowest frequencies have the highest stresses. So Alex, you were talking about running, um, running a modal analysis, where you look for modes one and two, right? Yeah, yeah you look for the first low, the, the two lowest modes. And that's common practice. Find the first two, and why? Because they generally generate the highest stress. Now, that's not, it's not absolutely always the case. There are things called critical speeds, which are frequencies other than the lowest that can cause more damage. So uh, let's go back to my chassis example here. So I have some sort of box with, um, let's just say, electronic equipment in there, like printed circuit boards. So I've got a box, and there are little printed circuit boards all stacked up in here like this. And this little thin box is being shaken up and down, let's say, like this. And the box is, is excited in such a way that we're concerned that these thin walls here, and it seems reasonable, that let's just look at the, the, the lid, if you will, this top piece. It's a bent piece of sheet metal, very thin, that is a reasonably large area in the direction of vibration. So if I take this box and shake it up and down like this, what's going to happen to the lid? In a diaphragm dish, if you will. So we could go through, and uh, tomorrow we'll see exactly how to go through and figure out what frequency that occurs at. And let's say that frequency is too low, or um, we've decided that the frequency is okay, that the amplitude is not sufficient to cause fatigue or damage anything on the inside. So that's mode one. Lowest, we've solved that problem. Okay. But what if at a higher frequency, we're shaking this up and down, the boards on the inside start banging against each other? Well, that is a mode that's going to cause more damage than the diaphragming mode that it occurs at a higher frequency. So the point we're really trying to make is that engineering structures have lots of natural frequencies, not just one. And the lowest is generally the first one you're concerned about, but other ones can, in fact, do more damage. The engine vibrates at several frequencies, of course. Now, any time any excitation force coincides with the engine or supporting structure natural frequency. So this, this structure, if you will, wrong one. This structure, if you will, has a certain natural frequency. So that's the natural frequency of that vibrating beam. If I was to excite this table at this frequency, then that would be an excitation source that matches the natural frequency of this beam, and you would get resonance, which means large amplitude amplification. It's just it's additive there. But our frequency is additive. I'm not sure what, what you mean. The, so if you excite the table at its natural frequency. At the nat at at this right here? Yeah. It amplifies? Yes. Yeah, it, it, it amplifies, and it turns out to be multiplicative. So uh, exciting any structure at its natural frequency will result in resonance, which is a large amplification of stresses, displacements, all of those things. Uh, and I said you use soft engine mount. Soft just means low stiffness.
So uh, this is a uh, an introduction to a discussion about uh, degrees of freedom. So this is this uh, automobile engine that I've been talking about. It seems reasonable that you could uh, that when this thing is is moving with the uh, the pistons moving back and forth like that, camshaft spinning around like this, they could easily vibrate up and down. It could easily vibrate from side to side. So that's that's easy to imagine. Actually, it's easy to imagine that it could vibrate back and forth as well. So that's three translations that it could move through, but it also, it can roll, it can pitch, and it can yaw. So there are three translations and three rotations that this thing could actually move through. And that's just assuming that it's a rigid body. So if you wanted to fully characterize the motion of this thing, you would have to measure three translations and three rotations. Uh, so a good example of the concept of natural frequency, besides the vibrating beam that I have here, is a pendulum or a swing. Uh, if you ignore friction and air resistance and pull the child back and let them go, they'll oscillate at a complement at a constant amplitude forever. So you'll get this, a sine wave that goes on forever with the amplitude remaining constant. But there's always wind resistance and always friction, so what you end up with is a decaying amplitude on your waveform. So the decaying waveform is what you actually see in practice. And the actual decaying, the relationship of amplitudes during this decay is an indication of the amount of energy that's lost every single cycle, which is also a way to express damping, which is energy loss per cycle. We'll see that at length. Now, uh, if you, as I said, if you excite a structure at its natural frequency, you get large amplitude amplification. So if I have this swing here and I push the child at exactly the right time, then the amplitude increases every cycle until you've wrapped the kid around the pole up here at the top. Uh, so that is inputting energy at the resonant frequency or natural frequency of that single degree of freedom system that we'll go through in a second. Now the, um, I work with a, well, from time to time, I work with a physics professor on campus uh, I enjoy working with him. Uh, he's for, for a physicist, he's a pretty good engineer. Uh, and uh, he does a demonstration or has done in the past uh, in his freshman physics class. And it's a good demonstration. It demonstrates um, resonance and fatigue. So he has uh, some of his grad students go to Home Depot. They get a large, long steel pipe, two inch diameter steel pipe, and they embed it in a, in a big bucket full of concrete. And he brings that to class, and he grabs a hold of it. Uh, do this. Uh, well, he, he tells one of the students in the class here, come up here and break this pole for me. And of course, the student comes up and pushes and pulls and all of that, and can't break this steel pole. He has him sit down, and he starts lecturing. And he grabs a hold of the pole and just does this at about one hertz or so. So the natural frequency of this cantilever beam is about one hertz. And after about 30 minutes, the thing will fatigue, crack, and fall over. So he's illustrated excitation at resonance, which is large amplitude amplification, and he's illustrated fatigue as well. I think it's a really good demonstration. Uh, but as with a lot of things at universities, you gotta be careful what you teach students, because he'll do that demonstration, and the next day we'll find light poles all laying down on their sides on campus. Students have figured out how to, how to resonate um, 12 foot high light poles. Huh. How long does it take to achieve large resonant response? If I hold the tip of this beam and then release it, I haven't changed the shaker controls at all, but it takes several cycles to achieve large dynamic response. That's a bit like pushing a child in a swing, isn't it? You have to push a number of cycles at the proper forcing frequency in order to achieve resonance. And that's why sinusoidal testing specifications dictate a slow sweeping speed to ensure that resonances are achieved. Kind of came in a little bit while that was going on. So it was pretty much having this beam on a shaker that is exciting it at resonance. 
So that is inputting energy at the natural frequency of this beam. And if that's resonating away, it's just happily resonating like that, eventually it'll fatigue and crack. But the idea was, if I just grab a hold of this and then let go, it takes several cycles to get up to that large amplitude. And again, back to sinusoidal testing specifications, imagine that if you, if you sweep frequencies very quickly, you can sweep right through a resonance before it has time to build up. And that's why a lot of specifications, sinusoidal testing specifications go slow so that you'll see these resonances build to their theoretical maximum. Uh, so th this is uh, referring to, I should look this up. I think it was the 70s where the is it live or is it Memorex commercial was actually being broadcast. Uh, so the way that this went down is Ella Fitzgerald was singing into a microphone, through an amplifier into a speaker. There was a wine glass sitting in front of the speaker. If she hit the right note and held it for the right amount of time, the glass would shatter. If you recorded that on Memorex tape and played it back, lo and behold, the glass would shatter. Uh, believe me, I saw that commercial. I thought it was actually pretty cool. But if you really think about it engineering-wise, it's not real impressive. That just means the tape can reproduce a C note. I, I don't care if it can reproduce reliably in the middle. I want a wide dynamic range, not just one particular note in the middle. But that's really what's going on. If you excite the glass at the right frequency and the right amplitude, then those amplitudes will build up until the ultimate tensile strength of the glass is exceeded and it'll break. Every wine glass makes a unique sound when we strike it. The sound is composed of more than one frequency. Let's subject the glass to different frequency sounds and see how it reacts. As we get closer to the fundamental frequency of the glass, we see the strip of paper start to vibrate. At the fundamental frequency, the sound causes the glass to resonate in its fundamental mode of vibration. The strobe light shows the glass in more detail. Although different parts of the glass move with different amplitudes, they all oscillate with the same frequency. We call this the first normal mode of oscillation. Notice there are four regions, or antinodes, where the vibration amplitude is a maximum. Now let's see if we can excite the second normal mode by playing the next higher resonant frequency of the glass. Again, we use a strip of paper to detect the resonance behavior of the glass. In this mode of oscillation, we can use the strobe light to now see six regions of maximum amplitude. As the amplitude builds up, the motion of the glass exceeds its elastic limit. son's a uh, uh, musician. Uh, he, we, we were talking about this video and I showed it to him. He was wondering if he could use his guitar to do the same thing. Um, and he, he's got a really good ear. Um, so he was actually able to take a wine glass and pluck it with his finger and listen to what frequency that was and then reproduce that frequency with the right string and the right fret location on his guitar and ring the wine glass. The problem is that if you if you pluck the string on a guitar, aren't you doing that? You pluck it and the amplitude decays away with time because of friction in the string and your finger and all kinds of other things. So even if you can excite the wine glass at its natural frequency, the problem is you can't hold that amplitude long enough to break it. And that was what he found. 
is you would need an amplifier with an incredible sustain to be able to hold the same amplitude at that frequency. And so he was unable to break the glass. Um, thank goodness for us, because then we would have had only five wine glasses. Uh, so it leads us to um, a discussion of suspension bridges. And since we're talking about structural theory um, this afternoon, um, I want to address the suspension bridge in its structural efficiency. One of the reasons suspension bridges are so attractive is that they are a very efficient structure. So we'll find out as we go into structural theory, the most efficient way to carry a load is in tension and compression. If I have a tension and compression member, so if I have this thing like this and I pull on it or push on it like this, let's just say pushing on it. If I push on it this way, then the stress here, which is load divided by area, is the same as the stress there, which is the same as the stress there, which is the same as the stress there, and the stress is uniform in this volume. So the entire volume carries stress uniformly, so it's very efficient, tension and compression. Bending and torsion, we'll see, are inefficient ways. So let's use tension and compression to our advantage to build a bridge. So if we do that, these towers here are compression-only members. <laughs> They hold the weight of the cables and the actual structure itself by being yanked on down. And cables here, the main cables and the suspender cables, those are cables or tension members only. So you have a tension and compression structure, which makes it very efficient. Uh, I don't want to talk about cable winding. Um, so this is a case study of the 1940 Tacoma Narrows Bridge that was started in 1938. Uh, they observed even uh, prior to its opening that the bridge oscillated and undulated and moved around during even slight breezes. So some days it would oscillate like this, other days it would oscillate like that, other days it would oscillate like this. But there was something seriously wrong. So they tried to solve the problem. One of the ways that they tried to solve the problem was by installing hydraulic jacks. Uh, that is basically adding damping. So what they were trying to do is to dissipate the oscillatory energy every cycle. That really didn't work. There was a lot of energy and they couldn't dissipate it away. Then they added to ties or stiffeners. Now this will lead, lead us to something that we'll do quite a bit. Um, so the natural frequency of a, let's just say a system is proportional to its stiffness. And I'm going to emphasize proportional. We see that it's not exactly that way, but um, you get the idea. So what they were trying to do was to increase the stiffness. If you increase the stiffness of the bridge, you'll increase the natural frequency of the bridge and maybe get it outside of these oscillatory frequencies that are imparted by the wind. Uh, the problem is natural frequency proportional to one over the mass. And anybody that's ever tried this before, it's really difficult to add stiffness faster than you add mass. You have a tendency to add stiffness at the same rate that you add mass. And if you do that, the natural frequency of the system is going to change. So you have to do it in a very, very clever and efficient way. And in the size of a bridge structure, it's hard to add stiffness faster than mass. So they tried these techniques and it really didn't do much. So they installed sensors so that they could be alerted if these amplitudes got too high. But they opened the bridge anyway. And that's what it looked like. And you can actually see right there, see those, uh, those cables? Those are some of the hydraulic jacks that they installed, uh, some of the dampers. The problem, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about this later in the next chapter, uh, you have to add damping or energy dissipation in the places where the amplitude is the greatest. And the problem is the amplitude is the greatest out here and there's nowhere to anchor onto. But uh, that's what it looked like. And uh, at some point um, on November 7, 1940, the bridge really started to move and it moved in a torsional way like that. And let's see.
On November 7, 1940, the winds were relatively moderate, about 40 miles per hour. A new mode appeared. Rather than ripple, the bridge began to twist. A wind of 40 miles per hour is not too strong, but it was strong enough to start the bridge twisting violently. And at 11 a.m., it fell. verified by wind tunnel tests at Caltech and at the University of Washington. Von Karman's explanation was correct. And ever since, no major bridge is completed without first passing the test of the wind tunnel. Has it that the only fatality was a dog that was in that car that they couldn't get out the dog went into the sound along with the car and the bridge uh, so there's what it looked like afterwards um, it turned out that it was this kind of thing that we have uh, here's our bridge with this kind of funny c-shaped cross section here with these large front panels on it, and the wind comes along and catches this edge right here and causes vortex shedding there and right there that introduces an alternating torsional load back, back here, which causes um, twisting uh, of that open cross section. And when we go through structural theory, we'll talk about torsion, and what we'll see is one way to solve this problem from the from the strict just structural theory standpoint would be to close that cross section. Just to put a panel across the bottom like this. And if you close that cross section, it turns out that the rotational stiffness, which we'll call K sub R, actually goes up by about a factor of 20, just by closing off the cross section. So a closed cross section is much more resistant to torsion than an open cross section. Well, that's one way to solve the problem is to make it rotationally stiffer, which will increase its natural frequency. But they've also, you would also accomplish something else. If you put a panel across the bottom, there's no sharp corner for vortex shedding. So now the actual force that caused the oscillations is gone. So you've accomplished two solutions to the problem and that's what they actually did. They just put a panel across the bottom and rotationally stiffened it and got rid of the, um, uh, uh, the vortex shedding. Uh, now, the vortex shedding, you know, because you got the top also. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like a, it's like a pole in the wind that's going to shed an alternating vortex. Right, right, out, out of phase with each other, yeah. Now, the, the question has come up, um, <laughs> why doesn't the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge do this? And it took me a while. Sorry? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> but the Golden Gate Bridge looks kind of like this. It's a suspension bridge that actually has an open bottom on it. <clears throat> yeah. It kind of looks like that. It took me a while. The, that's, that's one of the... You can see through it, but you're actually the one, the thing that drives it is the side is transparent. This, it's, yeah, it's, it's just, it's just a, a girder system, a truss system across the front. So the wind blows clean through instead of these sharp uh, and flat panels in the front. I'm really surprised that by, you know, 1930, that was still a problem. I mean, you could 
you know, and they were building the Brooklyn Bridge in, you know, 1880 or whatever. I mean, they knew there was a problem. They, you know, they realized because they had, you know, already had some bridges fall down. They knew that that was a problem. Yeah, yeah. It just seems like, uh, and and when you when you see it go off, uh, it just the the amount of of deflection and and twisting, the amount of strain that the structure could support just amazed me as well. It just looks like it was it was really insufficiently stiff as well. You know, apart from you know the the, 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 the torsion that was imparted due to the wind, it just seemed like it was it was so compliant. What do you what do you think? <coughs> Twenty feet? You know, uh, amplitude? That's that's serious. <laughs> Uh, a little more on vortex shedding. Uh, one of my colleagues was uh, summoned to NASA during the, the middle of the space shuttle program to look at vibration problems in the solid rocket boosters of the space shuttle. Uh, now, we're going to go into this in the structural theory chapter, but uh, I'll put it here. The stiffness of a tension compression member is A over L. E being the Young's modulus, which is the stiffness of the material, A being the cross-sectional area, and L being the length. So if that's the case, and we also know that the natural frequency is proportional to the stiffness. Uh, now you look at the solid rocket boosters, they're long members, really long. So L is high. If L is high, that means K is low. If K is low, natural frequency is low. So their axial mode of vibration, like this, is low. Uh, turns out to be around three hertz or so. That's pretty darn low. Well, uh, it turns out the way that these things are made, you can see there's a picture here on the left of them being put together. They're built, uh, they're cast with solid rocket propellant in sections in Utah and then shipped by rail down to Florida where they put them together like this. Well, the solid rocket propellant is aggressive nasty chemicals that don't like air. So they put seals in the ends uh, to, uh, to protect them from the, from the air. And then when they stack them together, the opinion was, well, don't just let's not take the seals out. Why should we take the seals out? They'll just burn away. And that's really actually what happens. The seal does burn away. So you've got a section, got this section here, Attached to that one, attached to that one, so this big, solid, tall, skinny thing. And there is the seal in the middle. And when gas comes here, so this is high temperature, high velocity exhaust gas, it does burn this rubber away. The problem is that it doesn't burn the rubber away as fast as the propellant. The propellant burns faster. So you end up with an annulus of rubber in the flow. And this high velocity flow hits that annulus and it causes vortex shedding exactly the same way as it did in the bridge. And it sets up longitudinal vibrations like this. And, but, you know, the natural frequency was only three hertz, right? It's not very, not all that, uh, not all that high, not all that bothersome. Uh, well, it turns out that the natural frequency of the human eye in the socket is about three hertz. So during a portion of launch where this vortex shedding was setting up these standing wave vibrations, the astronauts' eyes were resonating in their skull and they couldn't see. Hence, this guy going down to NASA to try to figure out how to solve this problem. Uh, I don't know how they finally solved it or whether they did. They may have just said, well, you know, live with it. You have for this long. So what are the effects of these uh, of a shock and vibration environment? Well, it, uh, the effects on humans can be psychological. In other words, the noise can be bothersome to people, or it can be physiological. Um, it can damage or bother people, like in the case of the astronauts. They couldn't see. That's a physiological effect. But if, uh, if a continual noise or just a continual vibration uh, can annoy people, then that's uh, psychological. It can also lead to equipment failure. The more fragile the equipment is, the more susceptible to this environment it's going to be. And uh, to affect remedies to try to solve these problems, we're going to go through certain structural theory and dynamic theory. Uh, where do these things come from? Uh, we're going to break sources of vibration into two broad categories, deterministic and non-deterministic. Deterministic just means we can determine the amplitude at any point in time. That's basically sinusoidal or complex vibration. 
it's repetitive and we can figure out what the amplitude is. Uh, uh, out of balance forces, uh, automatic weapon fire, engine uh, vibrations, things like that are deterministic. Non-deterministic, we cannot determine the amplitude at any point in time, therefore it's random. Uh, rough uh, road beds, turbulent fluid flow, those are examples of random vibration. Uh, shock, sources of uh, our shock would be earthquakes, handling, transport. These are single events, so uh, we don't have multiple earthquakes that uh, the two of the say are continuous. So it's a shock event. Uh, in transportation, speed bumps, potholes, uh, in rail, freight cars bumping against each other, uh, in uh, water or hydraulic systems, wave slamming or valve hammer. If you open and close a valve very quickly, um, you'll end up with shocks in your hydraulic system. Uh, in air, landing, catapulting. Uh, pyrotechnic shocks are getting much more common. Uh, guys do pyrotechnic shocks all the time. In fact, I have, a, I have a question for you guys about airbags. Um, uh, airbags, uh, seatbelt retractor squibs, um, Explosive bolt separation fittings, ordnance near miss, and slow gunfire would all considered to be pyrotechnic shock events, and of course sonic booms uh, from supersonic flight. That's uh, these sources of shocks. Uh, pyrotechnic shocks are getting much more common because more companies are using uh, explosive devices as actuators. Now, fragility is a qualitative way to try to measure the susceptibility of equipment to failure with regard to shock and vibration. Uh, if you're looking at failure, and we'll look at failure modes when we go into fatigue on Wednesday, but if we take and separate failure into two flavors, structural and operational, structural failures are permanent. So uh, if you have something that fails in a vibratory environment, and then you take that vibratory environment away and it's still broken, that means a structural failure, as opposed to an operational failure, where if you, if you remove the excitation, it suddenly starts to work again. And those of you that have done any kind of troubleshooting, operational failures are the hard ones to find. Oh, wow, now it works. Well, and it stops working, then it starts working again. Structural failures can be broken into first exceedance failures. First exceedance failures mean that the first application of a stress will cause failure. So that generally means that you have a fracture of some sort excessive plastic deformation or excessive displacements or deflections. Structural failures also can be induced by fatigue, which is a cyclic loading. Um, we'll talk about low cycle fatigue being less than 10,000 cycles, high cycle fatigue being more than 10,000 cycles. Um, and joint degradation, so you can have fretting from things uh, rubbing against each other, galling things rubbing against each other, and brunelling things banging against each other. Uh, operational failures, uh, a lot of operational failures are electronic in nature. Uh, they can be hydraulic or pneumatic. So if you have a hydraulic or pneumatic system and maybe your hoses kink during load application, then you will end up with a plug. And when you remove the environment, it'll open back up. Uh, leaks and shorts on electronic systems. Uh, potentiometers or variable capacitors can change settings. Uh, changes in friction, that the easiest thing to imagine there is a bolt that comes loose. And excessive motion between parts. I mentioned that with regard to the chassis, printed circuit boards that bang against each other. And what are the effect of these things? On equipment, could require frequent adjustment or continuous monitoring like the bridge. Could cause loss of other equipment nearby. Uh, when we go through um, some design considerations on Wednesday afternoon. We'll talk about printed circuit board vibration. And uh, you can have a printed circuit board vibrating at reasonably large amplitudes that doesn't damage the board itself, but it does damage the components living on the board. Uh, you may have to restrict your performance, or you may actually uh, lose all of your equipment and the loss of emission. On humans, can vary anywhere from discomfort to injury all the way to loss of life. So how do you solve these problems? Reduce the energy input. Does that mean I just reduce what the outside environment does to my device? Um, kind of. What it means is isolate your device from these aggressive environments. Or you can reduce the sense of system sensitivity. In other words, increase the robustness of your system to that input. 